Patrick, we've got some big changes coming up this year um, in our industry, Department of Labor. And I know a lot of people have some questions. You know, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I think it's important to note that the changes will be big for some firms. Okay. But not very big for others. You said big changes coming up. Yeah, it's big industry-wide. Mm. And it's big if you're not prepared. Mm -hmm. But I, I really do feel that with the direction that this firm has already been marching for a dozen years, the changes are really more minor adjustments here. Okay. Um, in fact, there's a, a pretty good handful of clients that will see absolutely no change whatsoever. Like the if the rule was never announced, our business relationship That's wouldn't true. change whatsoever. Yeah. That's true. So I, I think it's a little bit of a misnomer to say there's big changes coming to us and our clients. Yep. Um, you know what I what I see happening from this is some minor adjustments, actually some improvements in in really in our business and. I think that we're going to see some improvements in uh, our interactions and the way we're operating with clients. I really look at this rule and I say it's forcing us to improve our documentation. Mm -hmm. It's enforcing us to uh, maybe do a better job of saying, okay, yeah, this is our process. Okay. But fundamentally, nothing's really changing underneath the hood. It's like a new paint job for us. So I guess just take a moment, step back if you would. Um, I assume a lot of people, by the time they get to watching this video, have seen some of our other materials that we've put out there before. Oh, but in case sure. they haven't, um, really briefly describe what what's happening. Uh, what's the rule? When is it? Well, just what's what's the rule? Yeah. What's happening? So the Department of Labor came out with what's called it's and it's collectively either called the Conflict of Interest Rule or the Fiduciary Rule. Mm -hmm. And this uh, Department of Labor has jurisdiction right now over employee retirement accounts, and this rule really expands that to uh, individual retirement accounts as well. Now, that was a, the law, ERISA, <coughs> uh, that Congress passed, uh, referred to as ERISA, Employment, yep. Employee Retirement Income Security Act, I yes. believe, um, back in 1974. Got my history? Yeah. So when that was enacted, that applied to 401ks for, maybe, I don't even know, 403Bs. Yeah, pensions, 403Bs, yeah, that sort of thing. And some other stuff, too. So now they, the Department of Labor is saying, we're going to change the way we interpreted that back in the 70s, and now we're going to interpret that to cover more than just And there's pretty good plans. reason for them to do that. Okay. When they first wrote the rule, hardly anybody had any assets in individual retirement accounts. Sure. It really wasn't a big issue. Sure. A lot of pensions. A lot of pensions, uh, and uh, <clears throat> now a lot of that has shifted from pension um, and to a certain degree from 401ks to individual retirement accounts, especially as the baby boomers are aging and, and they're moving out of 401ks and out of their employment into individual retirement accounts. And so uh, there's, there's good reason to put some sort of standard in place for those. Uh, a little bit of confusion that's happened in the industry is that uh, their regulatory authority really can only extend to retirement accounts and it really doesn't cover what we would call a standard brokerage account maybe like a joint account or an individual account or something like that um, so that's sort of interesting at the moment and okay. one of the things that we pointed out is that we're going to treat all accounts as if they fall into this new standard i gotta believe that a number of firms will probably follow suit I, it, eventually they'll probably all get there so i i think one thing that i was thinking of as you were describing that is um, arisa even for the longest time, you know, 401ks, pensions were bound by certain requirements, um, namely for financial professionals who work with those plans. And we've been doing that for years as well. Yep. Um, we have these fiduciary requirements on us as it pertains to those 401ks. So um, this isn't new, completely new, actually. It's now just saying, well, see all those rules that applied over there, they now apply to IRAs, Roth IRAs, and interestingly, health savings accounts, MSAs, and covered L ESAs as well. So it's it's a rule that applied in a bunch of circumstances over here, but now it applies over here as well. So I, unpack, if you would, for me, what does that mean? Well, I think one of the things... What I, rules? Yeah, what, what I, what I want to bring up before I do that is that um, I think a lot of clients were under the impression that all advisors everywhere already had to work in their best interest. And unfortunately, that's not true. Mm -hmm. um, it w I wish that it had been in the past. We see from time to time portfolios show up at our doorstep when, when prospects are coming on board and we look at what they had and we yeah. go, wow, who sold them this? Yeah. <laughs> um, or you know why they sold them what they sold them. Yeah. Yeah. The, and, they, and in many cases, they sold them something because that particular product pays very high commissions. Correct. So 
Um, back Which is to, why the rule is called the conflict of interest rule. Exactly. So, so back to uh, unpack it. There's really a couple things that, and, and I think it makes sense to unpack what does being a fiduciary mean? Mm -hmm. And there's really a couple of duties that you've heard me talk about before. There's the duty of care and mm -hmm. the duty of loyalty. And those are the two overriding duties. So your duty of care is you need to do a good job, right? You need to have skill and prudence and you need to understand what's going on. You basically need to do a good job. Mm -hmm. Duty of loyalty means that you need to be loyal to the client, which the inverse of that is you can't be disloyal to them and the things that might promote disloyalty are high commissions. Could be. Could be. Yeah. And there's other things too, but right. but that's the one that comes from And a to lot of the cooking. other things stem from that, right? So yeah. we talked about, you know, documenting things and making sure that uh, there's clarity between the client and the advisor on, okay, for what you're paying, this is what you receive, which is, is funny because it's being dictated and we laugh because we're like, well, I might resent the fact that there's some entity telling me I have to do that, but at the end of the day, we we try to do that already. Yeah, we, that's exactly right. So, um, what else? I mean, this well, it, t April 10th, right? That's the magic deadline? April 10th, but before we go there, I think it does make sense to say, well, if advisors didn't have to work in clients' best interests in the past, what did they have to do? That was suitability? Suitability, okay. yep. And so, suitability is a word that sounds, uh, when you really break it down, how is that defined? Sure. And the way it was defined was you needed to understand someone's risk tolerance and their time horizon um, and make sure that what was sold to them meets the objective. Their investment objective. Their investment objective. There's a lot of things that could be considered suitable. That wouldn't be in their best interest. Which is objective. And again, I kind of, I got to no. laugh about that because it's like, well, who decides that? But anyway, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but one of the things that we did is many clients, we've, we've sent a letter out and it really breaks down in layman's terms, that fiduciary responsibility. Sure. Understand your goals. Um, make sure that the investments recommended align with those goals. And make changes. Make changes if yep. they're needed. Mm -hmm. um, have a good, robust process for selecting and doing due diligence on investments and investment managers. Now, don't just sell it and walk away. Right, yep. exactly. Yep. Yeah, and and uh, and so those are, are those are the things that we need to, oh, and transparency, of course, that you just talked about, sure. transparency of fees and, and expenses. And, and those are the things that when you look at it on a, Main Street, rubber hits the road level, that's what we need to do, which sounds a lot like what we do already. So let's talk a bit about, practically speaking, some, yeah. of, the, some of the deadlines, some of the changes, things that we're going to be doing here. Um, we talked a lot about the history of it, and I think we need, you know, what what's the expectation here? So I, I did mention the deadline, but before we do that, maybe, um, I guess I would like to mention, I'm not sure if you, you were prepared to say this or not, but oftentimes, you know, we talked before about this, um, commissions, you know, are often um, looked at as a conflict. You know, if, if you do something and you get paid, did you make that recommendation because you were going to get paid or because it was in that person's best interest? Mm -hmm. Now, we've always operated on this assumption that we're trying to pr trying ourselves in our business to to make sure that we don't even have those conflicts. That right. and even where we have certain uh, certain accounts where we get paid a, a commission. It's structured in the way that we get the same pay, regardless of what company we go with or what kind of investment we go with, right? So uh, aside from that, what's the opposite to that, right? Fees. Sure. So this really, for a lot of people, what they're going to see is this shift from, you know, A share, C share mutual funds or stocks in an IRA to maybe a fee-based account, right? Yeah. That's at the core what clients are probably going to see the most, right? That's what they're, on the face of it, they're going to see and hear a lot of that. That's not all of it, right? We know that. We've had right. those conversations. But from a what is a client going to expect, that's a big one. So if you're not in a fee-based account you could expect with an IRA, grow. you're probably going to be having that conversation. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, what's and why? It, well, yeah. So the reason for that is that a commission-based account, even in our case where the commission-based products that we sold in commission-based accounts, to us, that we used and picked the one specifically to simulate a fee-based arrangement. Right. But the reason that that uh, you'll hear that thing, okay, let's switch to fee-based now, because in that commission-based uh, account... It wasn't we, clear. Yeah, we could turn around tomorrow and sell them something that has a high commission. We could. Yeah. Not that we're going to, because we're not, but we could. And so for that reason, commission-based accounts fall under a tremendous amount of additional scrutiny. Yeah. And so going to a fee base just takes that, that possibility of selling a high commission product completely away. 
it brings the client more into the conversation too because now um, you know even even though we've never done that right what right. you described the potential did exist of course but uh, we never did that but those what we received from the fund companies often in the, if that in that instance was not transparent to clients and I think we've done a pretty True. good job yeah. of explaining that to people and but even if we explain it when they're in our offices they'll you know, like two weeks, a week later, the next day even, they might, like, oh, well, I don't remember. It was complicated. I forgot. I don't really know how you get paid. Right. So the advantage of a fee-based relationship is now that's transparent. That's Clients, right. That, that expense may be exactly the same. It's just now you see it before you didn't. Right. And the yeah. DOL cares a lot about transparency, as we talked about earlier, and that's another reason for the change. Yep. So I think one of the questions that might come up from clients, if I was a client on this side, I might ask, why didn't you promote a fee-based arrangement to me before? Mm-hmm. And to many of them, we have. Yeah. But I think it's fair to say that um, there were not fee-based products available for every person's situation yeah. in the past. Historically, the minimum for that was about $50,000 per account. Yep. Um, you know, we try to do that. We found it advantageous in many cases, and certainly in IRAs. Um, you know, it was a project of mine, actually, to look at the rest of our, our business, the rest of the accounts that we have that were not eligible for those types of programs and to look at something. So we had chosen to go a certain route, C-Share Mutual Funds, which with its cost structure emulates that. Yeah. Um, but it just was the only option that we had at that point underneath those limits. That's right. So it's interesting, a year ago, Raymond James created a, a little baby version of those accounts. Sure. Um, so whereas now that, that's, that same program with a $50,000 minimum exists, but now there's another program that has a $5,000 minimum. And they'll actually go down to 4000 um, so that's great. That's opened it up to a tremendous number of Absolutely. So now we look at it and go, well, you know, we didn't have this even 12 months ago, and now we do. Yeah. So it actually, this is where it's not going to be too different for our, our clients. Right. Now, a client at another firm that might not have that tool, I, don't, I can't speak for other firms and how they're going to do it, what they're going to implement. I, think, I know uh, some things other firms have done. I'm not going to get into that now. No, but I think you categorized them as cute before. <laughs> oh, yeah. I do. I, I did. I said, well, like one of these firms, I'm like, oh, that's cute. You want to do that? Well, we've been doing that for over a decade. You yeah. know? So for us, it's something we have great experience with. It's something that Raymond James, our firm, has a lot of experience with. So, mm -hmm. you know, to the question of, hey, why didn't we have this conversation before? That's why. Yep. And I, I, don't, I don't have any issue with that. And sure. I don't have any issue with going from one to the other because as I stated, um, our compensation is going to be pretty neutral. Actually. Yeah, it really is. We make that change in the cost for most of our clients is actually going to be a pretty the same if not a little bit better depending right. on what we depending on that person what we recommend. Yeah, absolutely. So we I mentioned before the deadline? Yeah. So So in I don't want to get too We're not there yet? We're not there yet. There's a couple <laughs> complications with the deadline because the rule takes effect April 10th and then also January 1st of 2018. Do they need to know that? They may not. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's different levels of it. So it's sort of like a soft implementation date, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. on, on April 10th. Like, hey, this is when these things need to have occurred. If you don't, that's okay. There's somewhat of a grandfathering in, right? But that's right. if you change anything, and there's a few exceptions, but... If you want to maybe even increase how much you're investing into that old type of investment, that might be one of those changes that necessitates us to have that conversation, right? That's absolutely right. If you've got something that's just sitting there, no money's going in, no money's going out, nothing's changing, you might be able to leave it set. But yeah. What, but, but to what advantage? Correct. Yeah. You know, we won't be able to offer the same advisory services on something if, if they're in that type of account. Sure. So that's a, that's the April tenth thing, yep. and then by 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 January, other things that really more affect us are going to take into effect. Mm -hmm. Take effect, I should say. Yeah, one of the things that that I've thought about is what's the long term effects of this rule. Yeah. Right. And now this is speculation on my part, but I really do believe that it's a step in the right direction for our whole industry, and I do believe that this pro this rule will get rid of the worst people products and processes probably that have been in the industry that's true we there are certain things in fact I had a meeting with a client last week and I and I pointed out to them um, you know this thing that this other advisor did in your account probably would not actually even be allowed going forward come, yeah. come April yeah. you couldn't actually even put it happened to be in a, an annuity a certain type of annuity I should say in an IRA which is sort of something we done we've done in the past as well but on 
that product was kind of a nightmare. But anyway, some of those things just can't happen anymore. Yeah. So as an example, there are a lot of insurance people out there running around calling themselves financial advisors, taking rollovers and shoving them into annuities that get 6% commissions. And that is like flies right in the face of what the DOL says. Hey, we don't like that. No. It's not, it's not transparent and it might actually end up being fairly costly. It'd be fairly costly. And when you have a situation like that, where you have that upfront commission mm -hmm. that's incentivizing that person to, to basically make a transaction happen. Yeah. Otherwise they don't get paid. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing with those is right. typically they have no ongoing commission or, or very little. So that really does the opposite then. It incentivizes sure. that person to, to sell it to and wash their hands. See you later. Good luck. See you yeah. later. And where is that investment going to drift to? Who so knows? We're, we're actually seeing maybe certain types of practitioners exit the business. Which is great. It actually is. It is. Um, and um, we actually got a client, I don't know if you're aware of this, back in October. Um, and the thing was the firm said, look, um, you need to take your stuff because at, this, at such and such a date, we're going to close our operations. The entire firm shut down. Oh, I don't think you told me about that one. Yeah, <laughs> I did. So um, there's some of that, you know, small small institutions. I, I got to say, because we're, we're on the precipice of this conversation now, that the support that we've gotten from Raymond James, our broker-dealer, this has been oh. critical. Yeah, it's been I, fantastic. I can't, can you imagine going through this process with this massive change? One, if our business was structured very differently or, or if we didn't have the support of a fantastic broker-dealer firm? It would be incredibly challenging and risky. Yeah. So we've actually had Scott Stoltz in our office before at this very table talking. He was the one on the Social Security video, if you watched that. He's also the firm's point man for all things Department of Labor related and has been getting, we've been getting regular communications. So we feel very good about our preparedness. Yeah, oh yeah. And of course, we have the tools already. We know exactly where we're gonna retreat to. So, you know, if you're at a broker-dealer firm, if, you have a, if you're not one of our clients, it would be a good time to talk to us. <laughs> yeah, because frankly, what we have to end up doing is, is the way we've been conducting business since the company was founded in 2004. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Patrick. Is, uh, do we miss anything? I, I can't think of anything we really missed. You know, clients are going to be getting communication from us and phone calls to make sure everything's buttoned up. Um, if you're a client of ours, you can expect that conversation. We want to make sure that we discuss and update your goals, which uh, is something we want to do anyway, again. Um, but I, I really can't think of anything that we've missed in this process. Yeah, we're going to try to make it as painless as possible, both for us operationally um, and for clients just through the normal process of meeting with them, which we typically do at this time of year anyway. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Patrick. of recording we're... it's good it's good stuff right there we're getting warmed up we haven't done this in a while yeah right me me Say me 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 you feel good there you go right there loosen it up it's ready <laughs> 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 he's gonna put that on the bloopers yeah. i know it i can see it now it's department of labor it's gonna be Huge. All right. So, Patrick, um, we've got... I don't want to do that. Nope. Didn't feel good.